please join me in welcoming back Dr. Peter Werman. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks for that great introduction. That's probably the best introduction I've ever had. Um, I'll try to live up to it. That's going to be a little hard, but I'll do my best. Uh, uh, and thanks for welcoming back to campus. Uh, it's been really a real nice um, kind of coming home, driving around the city where my kids grew up, and we spent a lot of time all over this area. And as I drive around, I just get all these memories of my kids' childhoods from a decade ago, and I, all these things I forgot about come back to life a little bit. Um, so to get started, I wanted to tell you first a little bit about what Kiva is, and then I'll tell you a little bit about its development and um, some of the really interesting problems that came up as we uh, brought it to life. Uh, the idea is really simple, actually. Uh, we use these small orange robots. They're about the size of a small ottoman. Uh, that can drive underneath shelving units and lift them about an inch off the ground and then carry those units, shelving units to the perimeter where people stand and do all of the picking in the warehouse. So traditionally, people would spend about two-thirds of their time walking around to get the products. Instead, the products are brought to them continuously all day long and they can do about three times as much work. At the station, their job is very simple. A shelf shows up. There's a little laser pointer, which you'll see in a second. Um, that tells the person where to pick from. And then she'll grab one or two items from that spot, depending on what the screen tells her to do, and scan them and put them in a box. So it takes only a few minutes, like five, 20 minutes at the most, to train a person how to do this job. Um, and from then on, they get better and better. And within a couple days, they're actually up to speed and quite fast at it. And it's fairly simple and straightforward signals, like the laser pointer. You can see this little blinking light that tells her which order to put the items in. There's a big quantity on the screen, so it's quite uh, easy to see how many units you have to move. Um, once the uh, picker's done with the, ro the pod, the robot takes it back and puts it away in storage somewhere. And right behind it is another robot bringing another item for another order. <coughs> so as Ken said, um, Kiva started in 2003, 2004, we got our first funding. And over the next six or eight years, we were able to convince customers to try it out and uh, started selling systems. Our first customer was Staples over there on the um, right side of the screen. Uh, they were the first customer we were convinced to take this big gamble and try this amazing but quite risky technology in their warehouse. Uh, after that, we were able to convince Walgreens to try it out. And then slowly, customers came on board and we deployed more and more systems. And you can see they're kind of concentrated along Route 60 through the middle of the country. We tend to find distribution centers in small towns that are within a drive of major metropolitan areas. Um, so they can do the picking in the evening and then get it to you the next day. Um, and so predominantly on the East Coast, but as time went on, we sold uh, some to companies on the West Coast. And then we even, up on the top right there, uh, had a few installations um, in Europe. Uh, oops, that animation, I must hit it twice. Oh, but of course, as I drove around the country or I flew around the country to go to sites, people would always say, I'd describe the system and they'd say, oh, you mean like an Amazon warehouse? And I always have to say, well, no, not an Amazon warehouse. They haven't bought any systems yet. But they did acquire some of our customers. Um, in particular, they acquired uh, diapers.com and Zappos, which we took off this picture. Uh, and so we started telling our potential customers, if you're a startup in the e-commerce space and you want to get acquired by Amazon, you should buy a Kiva system, because that seems to be the ticket. <laughs> but then in 2012, Amazon actually came and acquired us, um, and we became part of the family. So what? problem was Kiva designed to solve? Well, tr warehouses traditionally served a pretty straightforward need. They took in pallets from suppliers, they stored them for a little while, and then they, for the most part, sent cases to retailers at the, out, at the far end. Um, so it was mostly a, a task of breaking down pallets and moving the cases around to new pallets and sending them out. But as e-commerce blossomed, that task became harder. And this is a graph that goes back not quite all the way to 2004 or even the dot-com bubble. But
So you can see a very st uh, steady trend of over 10% annual growth year over year in e-commerce sales. <coughs> There's another interesting aspect of this graph which I like to point out. You see how the red line is kind of wavy? That's what's called the peak to mean problem. So if you look at any particular year, the spike at Christmas in e-commerce sales tends to be on the order of sometimes 2x uh, the baseline for the year. But because of this constant upward trend, you see that within two years that what was a peak now becomes the baseline and you keep ratcheting it up. And this led to a particular, this insight led to people being willing to invest capital even though it was only used part of the year because they knew in two years that would just be the baseline anyways. So with e-commerce, this warehouse problem became a little bit more difficult because now instead of um, uh, shipping full cases to retail outlets, you now had to deal with orders that were going to offices and homes as well, and they were only ordering one or two items at a time. So you had to open up the cases, pick items out, and put them in new boxes. And that was much harder. And traditional warehousing approaches were very labor intensive. Uh, this is a picture from an Amazon warehouse in the 07, I think, time frame. Um, and you can see just acres of pallets stored on the ground. Each one has a sticker in front of it with an, an identification, a location uh, marker taped to the ground. And it's hard to see, but there's a couple people walking around this space with carts that are going to specific spots to pick out an item for an individual order. So it was pretty common in this environment to, to walk on your eight-hour shift 10 to 12 miles every day. Um, well, when you think about it, what is this distribution center trying to do? It's not meant to be a form of exercise. Uh, and in fact, it's for the most part, people think of it as a cost center. It's just a place that costs money that doesn't add a lot of value. But what value it does add is in the sortation step. It's not the storing and the moving inside of the building that matters. It's the ability to, t to open the cases and mix and match the outputs. Um, and while you're trying to do this, there's always business pressure to increase the speed and accuracy of the task you're doing, do it faster with fewer people, uh, and generally become, you know, generally cost less than you used to cost. So this idea came about because a friend of mine from, co from my MIT undergraduate days worked at a company called Webvan in Silicon Valley during the dot-com bubble. And Webvan actually became the poster child for the bubble because they raised almost a billion dollars between their investments and the IPO that they had in a two-year period to try to solve the grocery home delivery problem. And what they did was buy the greatest technologies they could and apply the state-of-the-art warehousing equipment uh, to solve this problem. So on paper, uh, they seemed to have a pretty good business plan. They thought people would buy $100 worth of uh, groceries, and it would cost them $70, it cost Webvan $70 to get those groceries into the building. Then, so they had $30 that to work with. They thought they'd be able to fill the order for Mrs. Smith for $10, then to deliver it to her house for $10, which would mean they would make $10 on every order. But as they found out in that first year, some things were going quite well. They were actually, uh, the order size was $120, so they had a little bit more money to work with to solve the problem. But they were spending 30 bucks in the warehouse and another 20 on the delivery because they couldn't get the customer density and couldn't get the scheduling down right. And the algorithms to do that kind of, solve that kind of um, traveling salesman problem are quite hard to do. Uh, and then because they weren't doing either of those very well, they were actually losing another $10 to, to customer support for every order because Mrs. Smith would call up and say, you sent me the wrong brand of peas or you sent me ice cream and it's melted because it took so long to get here. So they had all of these ancillary issues. So they were losing $20 per order. My friend came in in that second year um, and tried to help solve the problem inside the warehouse. And what he found was a lot of the, what was the state of the art in automation being applied to the warehouse, and it was very ineffective for solving the problem. This is a thing called a carousel, which you don't really see sold anymore. Uh, this, you see this one person working these three devices. They're like the giant linear carousels that you see in a um, 
laundromat that can carry all the clothing around, but these carry these shelves on which are stocked products. And when an order, the little toad in front of her comes to the station, or there's a couple here, uh, these carousels spin until the right product's present. She walks over, takes the product out, puts it in one of the totes. And this allowed her to pick at about 200 lines an hour, which was uh, 250 times, or 200, uh, two and a half times the rate that she was picking manually. Uh, but you can still see, even in this little video, she's waiting for the machines quite a bit. And that's a lot of capital to spend to have one person, make one person more efficient. In addition, they were really loud. I have the volume turned off on this video. And, um, and they were prone to failure. And if you mismanaged the warehouse and you stocked some important item like a newsletter in one of these, and every tote in the building had to come over here, the whole building melted down. It's literally because the ice cream started melting and things like that. So my friend Mick Mounts, who was the founder of Kiva, said there's got to be a better way. Webvan had gone out of business, but they had done a lot of brainstorming. And he got the idea that maybe if we could find a technology that brought the, peop the products to the people, we could do, run a warehouse much more efficiently. And so we made this video a couple years into Kiva to kind of focus on the idea that we're solving this business problem. We want your staff to be able to reach out, grab a product, put it in a tote, and ignore the fact that it's a robotic system that's, that's solving this problem for you. We are solving a real business problem. So um, he came to me in 2003 time frame. This is actually a picture from Raleigh in 2003. Uh, this is my attic in my house in North Raleigh. And he said, I have this idea. Uh, I don't know if it can be done, but do you know anything that would help us solve this kind of problem? And I said, well, I don't know much about robotics, but if you had robots and you were trying to do resource allocation in a big system like this, I know something about that. So uh, I started working with them on the idea. As you, can as you saw in the video, the innovation is uh, pretty straightforward. Um, and it consists of only these four core objects. There's the shelves, we call pods. There's the robots, which we call drive units, again, to kind of distract from the idea that we were using robotics. Um, there's stations where the operators stand that has some infrastructure in place. And then in the back closet, there's a control system on our server rack that uh, actually does a lot of the control of the system. Um, so he convinced me to help him get started. And this is a picture from early 2004 with our first demo system. You can see um, these first few robots that were sitting on them. And there's some first inventory pods in the back uh, right picture of corner of the picture. They don't look much like the final robots. They're just little aluminum shells. They have almost no sensors. Uh, we had to plug them into those chargers against the, on the left side there, just car battery chargers overnight. Um, the pods actually had casters, so the robots couldn't lift them off the ground, but instead they had to dock with them and push them. And we used this system to convince people that we could see a path to delivering the hardware uh, that could deliver this solution concept. Um, these are the first six employees. Uh, Mick is the one in the back right. I'm there in the middle. And another key employee was Raph DeAndrea, who was, he's on the front right. He was a professor at Cornell at the time and was on sabbatical. We're about to start a sabbatical at MIT. Um, when we met him and convinced him to help us uh, start Kiva. And um, he was a professor in control systems and was well known because he had won RoboCup, uh, small soccer league, four of the previous five years. Uh, so he was the, exactly the kind of creative, uh, practical engineer that we needed to get this thing started. In addition to the, um, to the prototype robot system, we also started building simulations of what this warehouse would look like to show customers, potential customers and investors, that, we, that this would scale and we knew what we would how we were going to make it run at a large scale. Um, so this is an animation. Think of it as a top-down view of how the system would work. All the little moving things are pods <coughs> being carried by, by robots. You can kind of see a little black line underneath, which indicates where the robots are. On the right side are 10 picking stations. And you can see a steady stream of robots going to them. 
And on the left side, there's two replenishment stations, which you don't see being used very much, but occasionally a robot, like on command, one goes over there, and uh, that's where product is put back into the system. Um, and this was another key benefit, that you could have a system where you could do replenishment and picking at the same time. And it was, if the system provided uh, completely uh, random access to every product in the system, to every picker and every replenishment worker at the same time. <coughs> and because it was, um, so much of it was controlled by software, we could start to apply a lot of really interesting algorithms to make the system more efficient. So this is a, again, the same animation, exactly the same animation, but now the, um, the pods are colored by how popular the products are on the pod. And you can see the, towards the right are the red pods. They're red because they have a lot of popular products on them. And in the back are purple pods where there's a lot of things that are slow moving. And the algorithms are, for, are encouraging the red pods to be stored near the pickers so that we have shorter delivery times and the purple pods to be stored far away because we don't need them very often. We also use this animation to convince people that this idea would scale to uh, really large sizes and this idea of parallelism would allow us to <coughs> deal with very large warehouses. So this has hundred or about 100 stations in it. This is actually still smaller than an actual where Amazon warehouse now, but gives you an idea for the scale. Um, our goal was to, to hit this, to do these ginormous warehouses. And I thought for years Mick was making up the word ginormous, but I looked it up. It's actually a real word. It's in the dictionary. Uh, for us, it meant a target of 1,000 robots in a single distribution center. Um, and this is actually a picture of 500 because it's really hard to get 1,000 robots to line up and pose for a picture. So I took <laughs> 500 and I flipped it so you could get an idea of what that would look like. Um, so as you can imagine, there were a lot of engineering challenges. And uh, you know now you know this works. So looking at it now, it just looks like, oh, of course people could make that work because it works. But when we started, uh, there was a lot of people were kind of skeptical for good reason. It seemed quite hard. And nobody had run, as far as we knew, there had been one project that ran a, 100 robots all together for about an hour a DARPA project, but nobody had done anything at this scale that would be reliable, could run 24 hours a day, seven days a week for years on end. Um, fortunately, when we did this, there were a lot of enabling technologies that were uh, made it possible. Uh, sensors were becoming less expensive. Computation was becoming less expensive. Uh, Wi-Fi was becoming ubiquitous. And conveniently, there were many generations, a couple generations now, and people were moving off the one we wanted to use for the robots and starting to use 802.11b and G and others. Um, and we did a lot of things uh, kind of in a very practical way and took the right approaches on a lot of the sub-problems because we knew the larger problem of making this work reliably uh, was going to be quite challenging, challenging enough. For example, in the picture you might have seen these big stickers on the ground. The nav navigation system for our robots is what have evolved to small stickers spread about every meter. The robots have clever control systems that allow them to drive straight from one sticker to another. And then they use this each sticker as they see it just to do course corrections and learning. Um, this is an example of the kind of learning that's done. This is a uh, MATLAB simulation RAF did in those early days of the control system on the robot. And it's just going to go around in a square and you can see it's wobbling quite a bit because it's a brand new robot, just got turned on for the first time. But we run it around the square a couple times, and now this version, uh, which is about five minutes later, it's going to go around the square. And because it's adapted its control system and it's learned some of the offsets of its internal manufacturing, it now drives very straight. And so every robot um, uses this kind of adaptation, which makes them robust over time. It also makes them learn over time, so as their wheels wear and stuff, the system, the robot, each individual robot's constantly adapting to that. Um, and it it's one of the things that made the system very reliable. On my side of things, I tended to look at uh, this uh, from a high level, at what are all of the resource allocation problems. And uh, it breaks down into 
basically seven different things. Um, the top left there, you see a circle that has, uh, it's a pile of orders that the warehouse has to fill. And the first task is deciding which order should go to which station. And that decision affects how far the inventory is gonna have to drive, so that's very important to optimize. Um, then once we've decided which station, we actually can commit to which pods we're gonna bring over to satisfy that order. And that will take into account distance, but it also take into account synergies between this order and other orders the station is working on. So we can get what we call pile on, which is two or more picks from the same pod. It's a completely separate, or can be a completely separate decision on which robots will carry which pod to each station. By decoupling that, you get control over doing more just-in-time delivery to each station. Um, and we found significant savings by treating that optimization problem well. When you're done, uh, you can go put that pod back anywhere you want. Unlike traditional warehouses where things have a fixed location, uh, Kiva Warehouse is completely dynamic. Every time you move a pod, it can go back to a different place. And where you put it affects how, off, how far it's going to have to drive, the, how far it's going to have to drive the next time. And so you want to put the, uh, close, the hot things close to stations, uh, but you don't want to drive too far to make it in a good picking location for the next pick. Uh, so you have to balance that versus how far away those opportunities are from you. And this also lets us adapt quickly to changes in the popularity of products because as things become hot or cold, we'll automatically be resorting the floor accordingly. Um, it's an invisible part of the system, but uh, the robots are, have batteries. They have to be recharged periodically. It's non-trivial to do that in a complex system like this. Um, and so there's an algorithm that controls charging. That has to balance not just occasional charging. They usually do five minutes out of every hour in a charger. But they also, for the lead acid batteries we were using, they have to be reconditioned uh, and spend about four hours in a charger uh, every week. So there's this other scheduling component that has to come into play. Uh, for all the stuff that we talk about on the picking side, there's complementary problems on the replenishment side. Um, and then, obviously, uh, all these robots are moving around and the system is constantly doing path planning to try to coordinate them and get them from one place to another. We had pretty aggressive goals uh, for this and we knew we were facing a computational challenge that was pretty daunting. We wanted to be able to do this for systems that could have up to 1,000 stations, as many as 10,000 robots carrying pods around. There could be 100,000 pods in the building that we had to choose among. <coughs> the building could be doing 1,000 lines of output a day, which is you know a line item on your order. So uh, I'm sorry, a million, not 1,000, a million lines of output a day. Um, and a building could have as many as 10 million different products in the building. Um, most of these were uh, the right order of magnitude, so they're just a little bigger than the biggest sy Kiva systems out there. But actually on the different products, Amazon beat us on that. They outdid our goal. A typical Amazon warehouse where a Kiva system's deployed has over 20 million different products in it. Uh, and we had these computational problems that we had to solve in near real time because there's so many things moving, there's a constant stream of decisions that have to be made. Uh, early on we said, hey, we're a robotics company, so I said, we need our own three laws of robotics. Ours are quite a bit simpler than Asimov's originals. Um, so we knew people bought Akiva system because they wanted to make their staff more productive. So the first rule, the first law of robotics for us was don't starve the operators. Always keep them busy. And then because to do that, you uh, have to buy a bunch of capital equipment, we wanted to be able to deliver that solution with the least amount of equipment possible so that the return on investment for our customers uh, was, was interesting to them. The third one we didn't have right away, but it evolved over time, and that's don't do things that look silly. And it's kind of a funny rule, but um, it turned out to be the most powerful rule uh, because there's many things in a complex uh, robotic system like this that just evolve and you're like, why is that robot going over there before it goes over there? And it looks silly and when you're standing there with a the customer and they go, why did that robot do that? That seems really inefficient. 
You're like, yeah, that's wrong. So you got to go figure it out. So uh, we ended up developing this nomenclature. Uh, if you saw something and it just it wasn't right and you needed a way to convince someone that it was the wrong thing to do and they should change it, you said, well, that's a rule three violation. And that's still today the way you convince somebody to go fix something that's clearly wrong. Um, there's a lot of very traditional computer science problems built into the Kiva system. And I'm not going to go through them all, but this is a, an example of uh, inventory pod selection. So imagine the bottom left there, you have an order that you have to fill, and it needs a pink, a blue, and a purple. And those are spread around pods that are a certain distance away. And some of those pods, like the one on the top right, um, have more than one item from that order. You have to make a trade-off between distance and delivery and try to make an, a decision that's efficient for the robotic system. And of course, it's a well-studied problem. It's a version of set cover. Uh, but it's a little bit harder than just a simple set cover problem because um, we have to do this for many stations all at the same time. So we have many stations and we have many, many pods. Um, so it's a form of this problem called multi-set, multi-cover. Uh, and there's some uh, academic work on that, so we know some theoretical bounds on how hard that is. But it turns out the Kiva system's even harder because if you see the last line, it's dynamic. It's constantly changing. We keep getting new orders in the system and new deadlines, and people go to pick an item and it's not there, and so your plan has to change, and so you have to constantly adapt to the environment. Uh, another problem that's an interesting computational problem is how to do pod storage, which was problem number four in that prior uh, graphic. Um, so this is another case where you might think that perfectly arranging the pods for the next pick would be a good thing to do, but it turned out something a bit softer and some good heuristic uh, performed that, uh, perform that task better than an optimal solution uh, because of the dynamics of the environment. So what we did was uh, we were able to rank the floor by the proximity to pick stations. So in this uh, top-down view, all the pick stations are on the right and a few along the bottom right. Um, so all the popular or the best storage cells are colored red and they fade away to the top left. And then uh, when the system's actually in use, the heuristics, is, you know, more or less recreate that picture. Uh, most of the red pods are to the right and the purple ones are farther away to the left. In this case, the building's not full, so not all the storage cells are being used. Um, but it's not perfect. There's some red pods a little farther away and there's some purple pods that got left nearby. And that's because of the constant adaptation and the recognition that there's a trade-off here between driving really far to get to uh, what would be a considered an ideal pick storage location for the next pick uh, but it's very costly to accomplish that and just choosing something that's a little closer but not as ideal. <coughs> what they made this particularly interesting is even though we've broken it down by these separate problems, they're not de really completely decoupled. And decisions you make on the replenishment side affect pod storage and they affect picking efficiency and your choice about where to pick from will affect pod storage and replenishment and things. So sometimes it's better to pick to find a bin that's a little farther away, but which you can empty and make available for replenishment than it is to pick something that's a little closer. Okay. Um, take a little drink. Replenishment. replenishment. People need replenishment too. Um, <coughs> the system provided a lot of benefits to our customers. Um, there's a lot on the screen here. Of course, the biggest one is that it was a labor savings. And it typically, customers varied a lot in quite a few dimensions, but typically we saw that it was a two to four X labor savings for them, which put it into a return on investment analysis of somewhere between one and a half and three years. Anything beyond three years, most customers could not, uh, could not convince their finance departments to fund. So it had to be somewhere in that one and a half to three-year range. It also let most of our customers get more output from the same fo footprint of a building. It reduced their cycle times significantly, in many cases from one to two hours of order processing time down to just a few minutes. Um, 
So in a Staples warehouse, for instance, if an order came in that had a very high priority, we could actually complete that order in five minutes or less. Um, it actually added inline scanning to a lot of these warehouses, so their quality went up. Um, and the system was very flexible and supported a lot of uh, different kinds of products and product sizes. Uh, um, it was also provided some uh, financial flexibility to our customers because they didn't need to buy a whole system all at once. They could buy it as their business grew. And they didn't need to plan for buildings two years ahead of time. They could, because we could deploy systems in four to nine months, they could postpone decisions and, um, uh, and then make a decision, you know, in the, they could make a decision in the early part of the year and still get a building online by the peak. And then something that happened uh, that we didn't plan for that wasn't on our original uh, promotional deck for this technology was this technology allowed people to move distribution centers. Um, and that happened to us five or six times over the course of Peter's history before the acquisition. This is an example of one in uh, the Reno, Nevada area where diapers.com had a small facility that's to the left of the picture and they wanted to move out to this much larger building that was in this new industrial park uh, just outside of Reno. Now, I don't know why the people of Reno decided to, with all that empty space between that industrial park and the city, that's where they chose to put it, but I've, I've driven that path. There's only a couple of trailers and a lot of wild horses, uh, but that's where the, the new warehouse was. So they said, hey, we'd really like to move uh, to this much bigger building we're going to buy. We'd like you to, um, to move all the equipment for us. And, but you know we have three diapers distribution centers. They're all running Kiva. Uh, we're a fast-growing e e-commerce business. We can't afford to have the building down. So could you do this over the weekend? Uh, and you know most uh, material handling companies would have said, no way, that's, you know, that's inconceivable. But we said, sure, but we want to film it. Uh, so we set up two time-lapse cameras, one in each building, and Thursday afternoon at the end of the shift, we started using the robots to drive the pods over to the loading dock. We wrapped them in giant saran wrap, put them on trucks. We had prepared the other facility, so it had stickers on the ground and it had a server set up. But everything else needed to be moved from one to the other. So by Friday afternoon, you can see a lot of this equipment's moving and it's starting to show up in the, the new facility. Um, you can see a lot of the pods are being forked off and put into place. We used the robots to do it because they needed to be placed very precisely. Uh, no, the robots do it much better than people. You can see, I uh, missed my little timing cue, but you can see that a lot of the pods have been set up now. This is Friday at midnight, so we're still just over 24 hours into it. A lot of the robots have shown up. Uh, the stations had to be di disassembled and moved over um, by Saturday morning. Uh, you can see uh, the robots are starting to move around. They're doing some test picking. And by Saturday afternoon, 6 p.m., the move is complete. Um, the staff had now drove to this new distribution center, passed all the wild horses, to a giant parking lot, a much bigger building. But they went in and they walked up to the exact same station they had been working at two days earlier. I mean, that kind of thing was just like, was not possible before. Uh, and it's not something we predicted, but several customers found it useful as their, as their businesses grew. Um, since 2006, the entire fleet of Kiva robots has driven about 170 million kilometers. And just to give you a sense for that, uh, this is actually a, over a year and a half old. So at the time that I made this picture, we had passed the sun and we're on our way back. But if you add in the 45,000 robots that Amazon ran this, uh, this past peak, uh, I'm pretty sure we've passed the Earth and we're on our way back to the sun again. And in that original time frame, we had delivered 1.7 billion pods to picking stations with our fleet of robots. Over that same period of time, Kiva had grown to about uh, 350 people or so up until the point of the acquisition. And from that original six, see the picture on the bottom right, left there. Uh, the other picture is one day Mick said, hey, we want a picture of the company to show the, um, 
uh, the investors or the board of directors. And uh, instead of the normal just team photo, we're going to line up other departments in a human bar graph. And so we lined up by department to show uh, visually not just all the people, but how many were in each department. And that's how our 350 people stacked up. Uh, as we said already, there's Amazon has continued to deploy the technology, and now they've deployed 45,000 robots uh, across, I think it says, 20 distribution centers now. So that was, that was kind of easy. Well, uh, automating the walking that was going on in a warehouse, it's a complex system, but that's, that's the easy part to eliminate. What's hard is automating the picking. This is a picture of a real Amazon pod, and you can imagine trying to get a robot to pick out of something like this is quite a challenging problem. To help encourage development in that area, about two years ago I helped organize uh, the first Amazon picking challenge. We've had a second one since. The second one was held at RoboCup. This one um, was being, well, this one I was able to organize because a lot of things came together, together at the right time. Uh, I sensed that Amazon was interested in the problem. Um, they had had success by buying Kiva, and so they became very interested in robotics. Uh, the International Conference on Robotics and Automation was um, had a call for pr proposals to have robotics competitions. So th I found out that was open. And that was being held in Seattle, which is Amazon's home city. So all these things seemed to have come together uh, to make it feasible to convince the people involved that this would be a great time to hold this competition. Um, so we put together a, a relatively simple competition. We used the middle of a Kiva pod um, so that it would be, the picking zone would be in the range of most robotic arms. We reduced the problem the product set to just these 25 items, and we gave them to all the customers ahead of time, all the participants ahead of time. Um, and then uh, we made a proposal, put it out there, and we thought as we organized it, it would be great if we got five participants, 10 would be outstanding. Instead, we got 45 teams apply to participate, and we had to winnow it down to just 25 different competitors. Most of who showed up at the competition. Most of the commercial arms were demonstrated in some form. You saw a PR2 and a Baxter and some UR Universal Robotics arms. Here's an ABB arm. Um, and a lot of different, this is a, uh, I forget the name of that one, back, uh, Barrett arm. And then there were a few custom solutions like this team from India which tried to make a bunch of small autonomous robots that could drive into the shelves and grab each item out of each one. So they had 12 separate little robots. Unfortunately, it didn't work very well, but it was an interesting idea. You can see there were a lot of different kinds of grippers. There were suction cups and different kinds of hands. Um, and so it was great to see the variety of different approaches people tried, including grippers with special adapters for different kinds of products. Um, what are you looking at? Identify? That wasn't for me, was it? Uh, uh, most of the the teams used R Ross and Gazebo tools um, with some open source visual uh, CV tools, but then they also wrote some of their own custom, custom tools. So fee uh, custom software. So five minutes before it was your turn, uh, uh, the team from Kiva would show up. We had a couple of different layouts we would use, and we'd stack the pod. And then you had 20 minutes to try to get as many items as you could out of the pod. You, there was 12 bins, and there was one target item in each of the 12 bins. So you got positive points if you got the right item out of the, out of the bin and put it in the plastic tote. You lost points if you dropped things or if you uh, picked the wrong item. Um, that was about it. Or if you broke something. Uh, this is the third place team. They used a Baxter on wheels, a team from Oakland University. Um, and uh, so they were pretty successful. They got three items. They dropped a few, so they lost a couple points. The second place team was from MIT using the ABB arm. They got seven items in the 20, 20 minutes. Um, and then the first place team was the Technical University of Berlin. They got 11 of the 12 items. Uh, they had one mispick because their suction cup grabbed the label of an item next to the target item and ended up pulling out the wrong item once. Uh, but you can see uh, it was pretty exciting. You can see it was a little stressful for some people, but you know, 
Uh, it was great to see when they were successful. Um, and overall, it was a resounding success, I think. And uh, we ran a second one this past year. We learned a lot of lessons from the first one. So we made sure, so we reduced the participants to just 16, and we made sure they had a bay for the entire duration of the event. And uh, we also added more items, so the pods were more densely packed. And um, we also added a stow task to complement the picking task. Uh, it's also been really rewarding to see the number of papers that have come out because of the competition and several startups that have spun out because of people inspired by the possibility of solving this very important but very, very hard uh, industrial problem uh, of, of robotic manipulation. And I think what I, one of the things I really like about it is manipulation is actually, it's not just like an Amazon problem. It's a core problem in robotics. And solving it robustly will help not just people in the e-commerce space, but it will help people in home robotics and all sorts of other application areas. Um, so you can imagine as this technology grows, uh, there's still a lot of things that have to get better. S uh, we have to get up to realistically dense bins like you saw in that picture before. Uh, we have to be able to handle much more versatility than the 25 items that you're given a three months to play with. Amazon actually uh, has across the network, 30 or 40 million different items. Um, and they get a new item they've never seen before every eight seconds. Um, so there's a lot of challenges to rolling this out at scale. Uh, there's actually a lot of uncertainty that we're not very good at dealing with. And most of the teams so far have been focused on the robotics side of it and not the AI side of it. Um, so imagine when p products are actually much more densely packed, you need to be able to figure out a plan that can move other items out of the way so you can get access to things that are touching each other. Um, the reliability has to go way up. You can't drop one in 10 items in an industrial setting. Uh, and you can't take 20 minutes to pick 12 items. Like a, a human can do that. Well, I give the example that I could take my seven-year-old niece, give her the picture and no training at all, and a step stool that's like this high because she's pretty short. Uh, and she could do this all in about a minute and a half with no instruction. So, but sometime in the near future, uh, I think you'll start to see more and more automation in this space. That's not just the walking, but we'll start to see a lot of some of the picking covered. And with that, um, that's all I have to say for now. And we have about 10 minutes for questions. And I'm asked. <laughs> thank you. Let's see, do I have my ambassadors? ambassadors uh, have checked out on me here, so I will serve. Uh, what I'd like to ask you, if you have a question, if you'll raise your hand and we'll get the microphone to you. We want to capture your question on the video, so hold, hold the question until you get the microphone. <coughs> Questions? Here's one. Hello. I am a master student here. Um, the initial description of your Kiva robots handling the movement was was awesome. So one thing that came to my mind was uh, how does the factor of traffic coming to the whole um, s picture? Uh, there's so many robots moving around, and individual robots use sensors to stop for passing by robots. And how does that affect the whole system? Sure. Um, so this is one of those places where we uh, didn't try to solve the problem completely, but we tried really good heuristics and then tried to make it better over time. Uh, so this, the basic coordination mechanism is pretty straightforward. Um, we do use a multi-agent system architecture, uh, or we did for the, at least 10 plus years. Um, so there's different agents in the system that serve different roles. So it obviously it makes sense that there's a different agent for each robot. Uh, but there were also another few agents that did some of the allocation and coordination steps. And one did a kind of uh, space coordination. Robots would ask for reservations for space, and this central entity coordinated those reservations so that they wouldn't co conflict with each other. Um, they had sensors to deal with uncertainties and failures of 
in that system, but most of the coordination was um, centralized in that way. Now, another interesting thing about it is, as you noted, um, a lot of research in multi-agent robot coordination is you take a torus or some, some simple space and you create these random starting and ending locations and robots have to drive around. And so it's like this open space and um, all source and destination uh, locations are equally likely. But here, all the robots kind of start in the middle and they all go to the periphery and then they go back. So there's this funneling to destinations and then a funneling out away from those destinations again. And they're intentionally trying to get in line behind each other at these pick stations. Um, so, our, uh, so there wasn't really any academic research that addressed the coordination problem either at the scale we have or with the kind of conditions that are true of our system. So we found uh, good heuristics went a long way towards that. And then later as the company grew and I was able to build up a research program, we would tackle that uh, more efficient mechanisms as a research project and find ways to make it even better. But we found surprisingly that those good uh, heuristics lasted a long time and got us quite far. Uh, All right, here's a question. I want to get this to, you know, I feel a little bit like a pod. So I think there's an algorithm that would tell me where the m optimal place to be is. Who, who, who raised their hand here? You're a little right. slower. Though. I know. Um, so when you uh, when the team was developing the system initially, uh, did you find that making the robot was a harder task or developing the software to actually control it was hard? Um, they were both hard uh, in their own ways. Um, uh, RAF was phenomenal at building a control system that made the robots reliably drive from one location to another. And that was necessary for me to work with the software team to be able to um, to you know, design systems on top of that that relied on the lower parts being reliable. Um, so many people were involved in both parts, uh, the hardware and software. But to give you a sense of scale, we had about four times more software engineers than all the people who work on the hardware. Um, and it was you know it wasn't all complex algorithmic software problems. There were there was an API to talk to customers. Uh, warehouse management systems. There were a lot of user interfaces that had to be built. Uh, a lot of database stuff going on. So, but spread across all of that, there were many more software people involved. Another question. So I see it as a very challenging problem to make sure that you deliver accurately every time and if there is a mistake. How did you go about finding out where something went wrong and what is the average accuracy level that your customer expected from you? And if there was some problem, how did you go about figuring that out and fixing it? Um, yeah, so there's two different kinds of questions there. One is the uh, the kind of physical problems that occur when I reach in and I pick glass cleaner and I scan it and it says this is a notepad. Um, so that kind of problem is just part of running a warehouse. Um, and so our software uh, had to deal with that. And I also like to point out like the picking screen was two screens. You know, there's a laser pointer, it says pick two, you scan it, transitions to another screen that says put it here. Two screens. But the exception handling on that workflow was another eight screen. So there's another 4x rule, which is exception handling is four times as much work as the happy path software coding. Um, so built into the workflows were um, mechanisms to catch those kind of errors. And if there were multiple, like a pick like that, where the wrong product seemed to, to be in the bin, or you know, that could just be a human error, or it could have been the wrong thing was replenished here, could could trigger a workflow for the building where someone has to go count those locations. Um, there's a different set of problems, which are bugs in our system, uh, which we have to go figure out. And so sometimes, you know, the surface level analysis would say, you know, everything, uh, you know, the wrong pod actually showed up in front of the picker. So it wasn't 
The picker's fault, it wasn't the replenishment worker's fault, but we gave the wrong instruction at the wrong time. And so those were like normal system, like normal debugging things. They were go look at the data, try to figure out what happened, try to recreate it. Um, and a lot of those were easy, uh, but some of them were really, really hard. This was a very complex system. So we had a bug once where um, uh, we had orders that weren't getting filled. So they would just sit at a station for a long time, and we didn't know why. And because so much is going on, nobody really notices until you know the first order got stuck, and then a second order got stuck. And eventually, four of your orders are stuck, and there's no picking happening, and you have only one spot left that's doing anything. And finally, the person raises their hand and says, something's wrong with my station, and someone comes over and restarts the station, and the problem goes away. Uh, but it's a problem, and we have to go figure it out. And our top program and our programmer and I, we spent two weeks trying to figure out what was happening. And it was this very difficult sequence of events that led to a particular outcome where a pod wasn't getting, it was tasked to, be, to go to a station, but it was never assigned a robot. And the reason was for a lot of complicated things that uncovered this little tiny bug. Uh, and so with this system, there's a lot going on, so it can be much harder to find out what the root cause causes are. What are the economics of sending uh, something that's this big in a package that's this big, in a box that's this big? It drives my wife nuts. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know Amazon and all the other customers I work with, they don't try, they try not to do that. Um, but some, some things are so infrequent and cost so little extra money that they, they're on the list, but they never get above the bar. Um, I've recently ordered things that Amazon labels as add-on only. So like this is a dollar. So we'll only send it to you when you've ordered $20 worth of stuff. So I'm, I'm fine, okay, I can wait. And then I order something for $20 and all that stuff comes in one box and the add-on thing comes in a separate box. <laughs> Why did you wait? Um, and I worked there so for four years, so I know what's going on. I still don't know why that's happening. I think we have time for one more question. John? What happens if somebody runs, runs out in the middle of the robots? Um, they have sensors, uh, and they will stop. Uh, the pictures I showed you didn't show the full safety systems that evolved over time. Nowadays, there's a fence around the whole thing, and it's all safety rated, and there's kind of a lockout, tagout mechanism to make sure people can't go on the floor. Um, it's a challenging environment because uh, you could put the best sensors you can afford, I mean the best sensors available on the robots, but because they're constantly passing each other and they're carrying obstructions, pods full of things, if someone's walking behind a robot that you're passing, and then decides just as you get there to step out in front, there's just no way you're going to be able to see them and stop in time. So the best solution is to have technologies that stop the robots whenever a person is going onto a section of floor. And that's, we had software tools for that, and over time they developed hardware tools to help facilitate that. Um, so yeah. All right, thank you so much, Pete. Thank you. <laughs>